think we're going to die, so we may as well enjoy what we've got left. If I'd have dangled my hand down, it would have taken my fingers off. How far away were you from a bomb? Bright green sea cascading it through these great big holes like horizontal waves coming in. Their car had hit a pub sign and it sort of banana around it. Wills, how are you, ship mate? I'm all right, Royal. How are you? Yeah, surviving, mate. I'm surviving this, uh, surviving the apocalypse and... Uh, yeah, I feel like yeah. that, that film, The Seven Samurai, I think there's only two left at the end. And uh, yeah, I feel like I'm making it, I'm making it through. <laughs> yeah, you and the rest of the country and the rest of the world, I suppose. Yes, yes. Wills, tell me, how far away were you from a bomb when it hit your ship? Oh, if, if I could have reached out... I, I would have touched it with, wow. my, with my arm. It was below me. It went below me. I was yeah. on the deck above. But if I could have reached through the deck I was sitting on, I was lying on, I could. if I'd have dangled my hand down, it would have taken my fingers off. So just to set the scene here then, so it's the Falklands conflict, the Falklands war. Yeah. Uh, you're on HMS Glasgow, type, a Type 42 frigate. Destroyer. Destroyer, sorry. We have to remember that the sister ships Sheffield and Coventry get sunk in this conflict. <laughs> so it's it, your two sister ships go down. Um, we've actually had John Mew, the wonderful John Mew on the podcast. He was on uh, the yeah. Coventry when it, when it he sank. Was. He was the PTI. He, he walked around the ship as it rolled over. Yeah. I've spoken to John before. Nice guy. Yes, yes, very nice man, and uh, and uh, uh, someone who's overcome a lot of trauma in his life, and that's something that we're going to come on and speak about. But so, how old were you in the Falklands? Uh, it was 1982, so I would have been uh, there with me, coming up to my uh, 19th birthday. I think I was 18. God, bloody teenager yeah. in in a war. I know, yeah. It's outrageous, isn't it? But it was great fun, I've got to say, for me yeah. personally. Yes, well, I mean, there must be a massive fun element, mustn't there? Because people, we have these wars and then people still keep joining up. Well, <laughs> they do, but you're sort of doing what you've, what you've been trained to do. Um, I can't say, I can't say like the going there on the way there, it was fun. It was worrying because we didn't know. But during the thick of the action, um, we, we just took it as... Well, I think we're going to die, so we may as well enjoy what we've got left. As it turns out, we survived. Yes. And I guess it's interesting for you because traditionally the footage we see we saw on the television is in Bomb Alley, isn't it? And yeah, that, yeah, that, there was a lot of that. Yeah, that was quite severe because you could be on one ship looking across, you know, you might be looking at Sir Galahad and next thing you know, bang, it's up in flames and it's sinking and there's bloody thousands of men going to their deaths or getting horrifically injured, but you're out there, uh, you know, sailing around. Uh, I mean, I guess you're not really going to see other ships on that frequent a basis. And you don't know if at any time, what, you know, you, the, the jets could come over and bang, you're sunk and you're, you're, kind of way out there on your own. Yeah, we, we were out there with the two other Type 42s, the Coventry and the Sheffield. Um, we was on point protecting the rest of the fleet from the air attacks. So we were relatively close to them and we, we could see the Sheffield burning on the horizon after it had been hit. And then, of course, when we went in to do um, the naval gunfire support, which is like the, the close up to the Falklands and then bombard the, the mountains and the Argentinian dugouts, wherever, um, we, we used to go in with an, another ship, so it was, it was relatively close to ships, but most of our war wasn't fought in Bomb Alley. In fact, I'm not even sure we went in Bomb Alley. 
Wow. And so there you are on board one day, obviously on board, otherwise you'd be a bit, bit wet. Um, <laughs> and, and what kind of, what kind of bomb was it? Was it from one of the, from, well, obviously from one of the jets? Yeah, it was one of the fast jets. We'd, we'd gone, we'd, we'd sailed it. Our, our skipper um, wanted to entice the jets over. So when we went in, when we closed up with the Falklands to, to do some bombardment, we went in during daylight hours because they can't fly during the night. So we went in on purpose to try and entice some of their jets over. And unfortunately, uh, some of our main guns and weapons jammed. So they came across, there was three waves, three waves of four jets dropping bombs on us. Uh, we got hit once, um, but it was it, that was particularly frightening because they were all over us and we were firing. There was huge amount of noise, and um, you know the, the machine guns and the Ehrlichans and the main guns going off, trying to protect us. We was, we was we were swarming around us. To be honest, we were very lucky. We were very lucky. We only got hit once. Nobody got injured. It was it was a bit. <laughs> it was amazing. It was uh, the bomb went straight through without exploding. Straight through, um, right past straight you. Through. Yeah, right, right, just below me, just within within touching distance below where I was, I was, I was uh, taking cover on the deck because mm. we knew that they were there. We knew it was going off, and we knew that the main missile system had failed, and so it was just a case of trying to make yourself small. And I was right in the middle of the ship, like the very widest part, um, probably where you'd aim for if you was a jet pilot. To be honest with you, the, the biggest, fattest part, get the most damage, and and that's what happened. There was, there was men that I know who were in, I think there were three. Three men were in, actually, after engine room underneath where I was. And um, it missed all of them. It came very close, even closer than, than me, probably, over the top of the heads of some of them. Um, they survived, obviously. And uh, I was part of mobile damage repair, so I got dragged down into the engine room by the chief stoker, along with some other mates. And we set about repairing the two huge holes that were on the waterline. It was amazing going down the ladder and seeing daylight in the engine room. It just like blew me away it, and bright green sea cascading it through these great big holes, like horizontal waves coming in. And um, within a, a, a relatively short amount of time, we were shipping a huge amount of water and uh, we set about fixing it. It took days. We were freezing. We didn't have a chance to put our once only, you know, the orange survival suits that you can put on. Well, we didn't have a chance to get those on, so we were stood there in cotton overalls and we were going into hypothermia. We were getting electric shocks from all the uh, damaged wiring that was dangling down on us because we literally, we were way below the, once we got into the engine room, it was way below the waterline, so we was having to scramble up, up the equipment and the uh, machinery to get to where the hole was so that we could start trying to do something about it. And we were covered in diesel, it was it was hell on earth to be honest with you, but um, like the armed forces um, sense of humour, it, it was just non-stop. We were laughing and giggling. We were holding. If you imagine a pyramid, like you would do, um, three blokes at the bottom, two blokes on the next level, a bloke on the next level, and then one at the top. We were like that, trying to hold the guy at the top up so he could let go with his hands and do the work above him on the hold that was there. And as he got an electric shock from the dangling wires, we all got it. And so it was painful, but it was really funny. We just, we found the funny side in everything, although it was a really scary. And at this, at this moment, um, the, the, the jets are still coming in on us. They're still firing at us. And, you know, this, um, and was it reminiscent of the Drew unit, the, the damage repair unit at, at Rally? Or had, had you oh, done yeah. that? Yeah, I've done that, absolutely. And I had done it not very long before either, because I'd only sort of been in about, um, a year and a half, something along those lines. Uh, yeah, it was very much like that. It's freezing cold, but the holes were much the holes much bigger, so it became more of a problem. Where before at the damage control unit, you, you, you put, you're making um, repairs on little splinter holes in pipes or on the side of the ship that you can use wedges and things for pad pieces. On this, it, it was it was a a large a large diameter hole on the yes. directly on the side of the ship. So every time a wave hit the side of the ship, which was like every 10 seconds, a huge amount of water would just push in and, and sort of knock us off balance and we'd have to start all over again. It was knocking all the materials away that we were using to, to sort of um, fill the gap. Uh, it took days. It took about three days before we got the, the flooding under control. It was, you, it, was, it, was, 
Could you have not dropped drop someone down the outside and put a patch over it? Um, I don't think so. See, you need... This is it. This thing about the Royal Marines and the Navy, you need us to bloody show you what to do. Well, listen, mate. Do you know, if you'd have been there, I'm sure we would have thought about it. I mean, in fact, we could have, if we could have lashed a few uh, Royal Marines together, we could have used them as pack pieces on the outside. They wouldn't have minded. Hey, that's, we, that, that's, you know, a, that's a great use of manpower. It is, yeah. Where yes. there's no brains, there's no feeling. When we did the damage repair unit at Rally before I went to sea, um, the, the, the chief petty officer, I think it was, leading the course, or it might have been a PO, he said, right, right, fellas, this is a wedge. Does anybody know what it's used for? And Rich puts his hand that went, uh, wedging? <laughs> Your number, sunshine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a funny guy, Rich. There's another thing at rally, isn't there? That they they don't let you call it a hard hat. It's it's a safety helmet. Right? And one thing on our course is, right, fellas, this is not a hard hat. You will refer to this as a safety helmet. <laughs> so, so on our um. When we went to the, I think we went to the damage repair unit or something, the, the um, PO said, right, folks, what's this? And he, held, he, he holds one up and uh, Rich says, it's a hard hat. <laughs> 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 um, yes. And there's a PO just, you know, he could tell that there was some joke going on, but he just clearly, he, he, he wasn't getting it. Um, yes, so my god, so you're a teenager, you're in the Falklands. What was it like coming home? Did you come back to, to Plymouth or Southampton? Well, we came back to Portsmouth. Um, that, we were, why am I saying Southampton? That's a civilian port. Um, that's what I, I meant. Some of, some of the civilian ships left from Southampton, I believe, like mm. maybe the Canberra or something that probably was involved. The port was probably involved, but um, we came back to Portsmouth. We were, the, the Glasgow was the first ship into the total exclusion zone. And it was the first ship back home again because of the damage that we'd received. So when we got back, there was no other ships in the dockyard. We got the whole of the dockyard to ourselves. So we had a few weeks fixing up the equipment and the, the engine stuff in the, uh, in the engine room. It was just so surreal. It was surreal. The very first moment I got off the ship, there was a huge um, party of family and friends and the Royal Marines were marching up and down with, with playing the trumpets. What, what, what instrument did you play, Chris? Me, mate, I played um, lying on my bed. Is that an instrument? <laughs> <laughs> a triangle. I was expecting a triangle. So I'll we had this big what, fan people, bit. People joke, right? I, I bloody wish I did learn an instrument because at least I'd have had a skill when I left the forces. Yeah. And, and not just a skill, but a bloody admirable one that um, I'm still crap at a guitar. I've bloody put hours into trying to learn that thing. So I, I'm. I think the musicians, they've got the best job in the, in the Marines. Yeah, I think you're right. It's interesting. They have to do the actual all the, the, the commando course, don't they, to be able to do like the uh, stretcher bearer and um, play an instrument and stuff. Um, no, that's not right. For some, Is it not? Oh, right. No, they, they don't even do any. Uh, they, I'm sure they probably take them up to the woods and teach them how to make a fire or something, but no, no infantry training. Not, not that with it. Okay, let's start again. So, absolutely nothing to do with Limston. The only band, okay. the only band members at Limston are when they come down for the pass out parades, um, and then they're just spectacular. They, they're, it, they all wear these animal skins. I'm surprised they're still allowed to do it these days. I'm, I'm guessing they're probably synthetic or something, but they, where you know, some guy comes out dressed as a tiger and banging a drum and. <laughs> Next guy comes out just dressed as a giraffe and he's got a trombone and it's all <laughs> it's, it's pr pretty mental. Um, but uh, no, what they're based in Deal, aren't they? That, and that that's where the bomb, uh, went, bomb went off, wasn't it, back in the day? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, and I, they they are trained medics, so yes, they would be stretcher bearers. Um, I did another fascinating. Um, uh, 
podcast. I'm trying to remember the... Uh, I'll see if I can find it while I talk, but back to your story. Um, was what, what Did you get any reception committee when you came back? Yeah, all the family came down to Portsmouth, into the dockyard. It, it was absolutely awesome, but it was just so surreal. So we, I immediately got off the ship. I, I, was, I wasn't required um, straight away to do any more duty, so I was one of the lucky ones that got off and managed to uh, find my family in the, in the crowd. And we went into uh, South Sea, went to had a walk into South Sea, and I was stumbling around. I'd, I'd got my sea legs and I couldn't unget them. So I'd been sort of walking down the walking down the road and then suddenly start leaning to one side and I couldn't quite work out what was happening. I'd lost a huge amount of weight as well because we'd, we'd started to run out of food and all the basics on board because we weren't expecting to be there. So um, I, was, I was hankering after fresh fruit, stopping at all the shops and, and it, was, it was too late to go to the shop by the time we got in. So I was look, looking through all the windows of the green grocers and, and thinking, oh, my mouth was dribbling and all I had to do was drink beer. It was awful. <laughs> so let's come on to your time in a fire service. Um, yes, because, well, let's be honest here. You're, you're accumulating quite a lot of trauma, aren't you, as you'll go? I mean, you've already been to war. You've already had a bomb go right past you. Did you have, would you say you had one of these challenging childhoods? What? Will, no. Wills that, that no okay no not at all no no my, my childhood was uh, fairly standard just a um, an average kid sorry for, okay our, at school. for our friends at home that might be wondering what a random question no it's just that um wills is a trauma specialist and we're going to come on on to that and i'm was just i'm just trying to do the background bit also can i just say folks um, this isn't a new look. This is, I've just been for a run and I didn't have time to, I, I literally didn't have time to get changed. So um, yes, this is, this is how I look when I run. <laughs> um, sorry, Wills, I should have made more of a tension. I, I'll be honest, I did, a, I got back from my run and I, um, I had a video that I've just been meaning to do for ages and ages. And I thought, right, I can squeeze it in. I can squeeze it in. And then I ran over time. And so, uh, yes, that's why I'm wearing my Rocky, Rocky Balboa gear. Um, yes. So fire service, tell us about it, mate. I left the Navy in 86 and joined the fire service in 1990. So I had a bit of a gap, but it wasn't long. Um, and it was at the moment, it was like a, the busiest time that has ever been in the fire service, my service uh, cut straight through that time where it was just a fire call after fire call or road traffic crash after road traffic crash. And it was like boys' own stuff, very much like being in the, in the Falklands all over again. It sort of, it didn't hit me as a shock because I sort of expected it when I joined up and it didn't, it didn't disappoint, let's put it that way. There was plenty going off. Let's just take it one step at a time. So one of the things we do before we go on ship which is fascinating is the firefighting course isn't it yes hms phoenix i think it is yeah and it's the full for 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 people that haven't done it it's the full monty it's all the breathing apparatus the asbestos or not asbestos but you know the fireproof suits yeah um first rule aim at the base of the fire all this kind of stuff and on your training you go into this burning building and you have to find your way around in this thick black smoke, and they're throwing on—I don't know what they put on—is diesel or something to diesel. It was diesel. Yeah, make it just black, and you've got to have your hand on the guy in front. And I'll be honest, I absolutely loved it. There wasn't any—I'm—I'm I'm, I'm guessing in reality it, to be on a burning ship or whatever would be bloody frightening. But in, in training, it was just great, great, great fun. But did that stand you in? Any kind of stead to get in the fire service? No, <laughs> not at all. No, I mean, to, to be honest with you, trying to get in the fire service back in the day was like trying to get in the SAS. You had to be a, a bit of a freak and fit their exact requirements. And to do that, there's not many people can fit their exact requirements. Um, and they've got rid of they've gotten rid of a lot of them because they, they were excluding certain sections of the community. So it was it was a bit of a uh, a surprise to be able to get in, just being able to 
like a penny going through a machine. It's got to be the right size, the right weight, the right everything. And if you manage to drop through all the way, then you're in. And if you don't, you'd be rejected. It was quite a harsh uh, selection process, for want of a better word. Yeah. So, so it was difficult to get in. And what was the boredom factor like? Because obviously when we're in a military, we do lots of guard shifts and you do obviously watches in the Navy and, and probably not so bad for you guys, but when we're standing on a main gate or something for four hours in the freezing cold at midnight and then you get you go back to a picket room and you sleep for four hours and then someone wakes you up and you're like oh god that four hours went quick and then you're back on the gate again um and in, in between when you're not sleeping or on the gate you watch just endless videos that you've seen 30 times already and drink endless cups of tea um what what what's that aspect like in the fire service um, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think there was a really huge amount of time to, to get bored. I mean, we could sleep on nights. There's a lot of fire services don't allow it anymore, but we could sleep on nights. But to be honest with you, we did need it. Um, we was doing a lot of training. And if it wasn't physical training, it was like touching the equipment and getting it out and drilling um, because you, you need to be up to speed with it. If you think about somebody rings 999, the fire service turn out every single time and you're the last port to call. If you can't do it, we're really in the shit. So you need to know what you're doing with the equipment and have ideas and alternative plans to be able to do stuff. And you can't pull those things out of thin air. You've got to practice. And it, it is practice, practice, practice. So there, there is downtime. I mean, you can sit around and have a cup of tea. We do lots and lots of lectures. There's obviously the ability to game of pool or ping pong. But in the main, we're doing some really good work, mm. some, re some really hard work that uh, taxes your brain and your body. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite good. So there isn't, I never found myself getting bored, really. Okay. And so how, what's it work then? Does a siren go off or does a bell go off and you've, you've, you've got to run for your, what do you call it, a unit or something? Oh, right. Yeah. So your appliance. So you, appliance, uh, mainly, sorry. Yeah, the appliance. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, the fire engine, for want of a better word. Mm. So on, in the whole time, on, in the full-time fire brigade, which I was, um, we, you, you have a watch. Uh, we had red, white, blue, and green. I was on white, and you're a shift, so you all go together. So in my station, we had two fire engines. One was part time; they used to run in from home, and we were the full time as the professionals. So you slide down the pips would come on, the lights would come on to tell you which fire engine was going, and then you slide down the pole, uh, jump on the fire engine, blue lights on, and away you go. All the exciting stuff. The moment you tip, you tip out the station, yeah. So and, and the, I was at my the main station I was at, Station 26. I was there for about 16 years. So I got to know the place fairly well. And, and it was the area where I worked as well, which was always a bit disconcerting in case you came across something where you knew the people, you know, casualties in car, I mean, which has happened, casualties in car crashes, uh, house fires and stuff where you've, you've uh, stumbled into people that you know. But it's also helpful because you know the area, so you can be there double quick time. All right, so talk us through some of this stuff because um, I've spoken to police officers in the rapid response units, first on the scene of, you know, horrific crashes, and they, they from what I gathered, I'm guessing not everybody does, but the, the, certainly the chap I spoke to compartmentalised it really well. Yeah. Um, but, but, can you describe the scenes? You know, what's the worst thing you've had to turn up to? That's a, I mean, that's a I, really, I mean, they're that's all a really obvious question, and it's it's one that um, I've asked been a lot, been asked lots of times. And of course, being being the fire service, we all go, oh, we don't talk about those sort of things. I suppose the biggest loss of life, I think, they were in one area of my brigade, which I was neighbouring to. Um, we turned up to a car that had hit. A, a pub sign sideways it had skidded down the road they'd been, they'd been racing and these guys were all big heavy sportsmen I'm not going to say what sport they play because it would be obvious who they are and they hit this car they, their car had hit a pub sign and it sort of bananaed around it and it crushed I think in all there were five casualties there were five fatalities and these guys were six foot plus 
They were big, heavy dudes. And it was just amazing that um, as we got them out one by one, there was one left that was still alive in the back. And so we laid them out on the pavement and, and we were sort of covering them up with blankets and things like that. But the blankets weren't, these, these were man mountains. The blankets weren't big enough to cover them. So like the, the legs and knees would still be hanging out at the end. And the huge, great big size, 22 boots or something. These, these guys were superhuman guys. There was one still trapped in the car. And my friend was uh, tending to him. We'd taken the boot off the car so that he could crawl inside. And he sat in the boot of the car and leant forward and put his arms around the guy who was in there. This guy was trapped by the car. The car had crushed in onto him, so he couldn't move, but he was conscious. So um, when you're trapped by your injuries, if you release the car, quite often you can bleed out into your body and die. And that's what, exactly what happened. My friend, my colleague had been talking to him probably for about three quarters of an hour, keeping him conscious, reassuring him, his arms around him, talking very quietly. This is one of the things we do. People think, I don't know what people think, but quite often the person who climbs into the car to assist the casualties, the best thing they can do is give them a hug, put their arms around them and speak quietly into the ear, explain what's going off. You're going to be okay. The doctor's on his way. Things like this. This is what my friend was doing to this guy in the back. And as we slowly peeled the car away from him, he, he, he lapsed into unconsciousness and died in, our, in my friend's arms. That was one of the most traumatic things that I saw. And it was based on just the amount of casualties that we had to, we had to remove from the car. And then the only one that survived for a short period uh, died. And we, we were sort of, we, we sort of knew it was coming as well. So, you know, like taking messages, is there anything you want to tell anybody and things like that. And that is fairly traumatic. When you, when you get a relationship, you turn up to a dead body and the body's dead. You, you nurse somebody and get your arms around them in the most traumatic incident and they're dying. That, that touches your soul a little bit. Yeah, that can be, that can be upsetting. But we, we've got, in the, in the fire service, we used to have a great way of dealing with that sort of trauma. We'd go back onto the station and we'd start finding all the fun and, and picking the, the dark humour, let's put it that way the dark humour where we would, we would find something to laugh and giggle about, talk about the incident until everybody sort of got bored of it. And then that was our therapy and it worked. The police used to go out one at a time patrolling. If they came across something, they used to be really upset and go off sick. The fire brigade were a unit and we expected it and we weren't alone. And then when we got back to the station, we talked, we spoke about it, had a cup of tea and, um, and dealt with it that way. And it was really, really effective. But, you know, things have changed. And, and so for that reason, people don't feel they can talk anymore in the fire service like we used to do. So I think people get more traumatic reactions because they're not as open and they can't say the things that they want to say and, and have that dark sense of humour for fear of being disciplined. There's a lot of that. Yeah, that's, that's what holds the trauma in people, not being able to talk about it. Whereas we just, we had nobody, we had nobody to pick us up on it. We just said what we wanted and laughed and, you know, cried if we needed to. So it was just one of those things. Big thing, talking. Talking your trauma through. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing also, I think people are quite shielded from death. So when it happens, yeah. it's quite shocking for them. Whereas I... You I know, mean, some of the worst things are, the worst incidents, like not necessarily because of what's happened, but it's at night time. I think incidents are worse at night time because you can never quite see what you're walking into. And we have these great big flashlights. So you walk up to two cars in collision. You can see some casualties in there, but it's not until you open the door and, and shine your torch in that the, the blood, and you know, it just becomes bright, crimson everywhere. Whereas during the daylight, it doesn't seem quite as, you know, black and bright red. At night time, it's black and bright red. In the daytime, it's all the colours of the rainbow. You can... It's not quite as shocking. So I always felt that the, the, the nighttime fires and the nighttime road traffic crashes uh, were probably worse because of, because of the visual effect of it being dark and then shining a, a light through and all of a sudden, bam, you know, there's limbs hanging off and, and, and cut heads and blood everywhere. So that, that, I mean, that can be quite, that can be quite harrowing. If, if, you, if you don't talk it through and, and get it off your chest in a way that you you feel you can say what you want to, like we used to do in the old days, I suppose. 
if you don't feel like you can do that and you then you sort of package it up and keep it in, that's where all the bother starts, to be honest. In, in a nutshell, mm. that's where all the bother starts. Is it a lot more shocking to see someone that's, I don't know, they've been decapitated or they've been really badly smashed up as opposed to, I mean, many people, I don't know, sit with a loved one when they die. I think we've a lot of us have done that, right? Or my, my mate Lee drowned, um, drowned in a in a lake. So I was kind of sat on the shore of the lake with my mate's dead body right next to me. But that it's just like their time had gone, right? You know, their their time has gone. It's a it must be a different thing when someone's been like bloody ripped to ripped apart i mean is i'm asking you because i haven't experienced i haven't experienced that wills is it is it is it is it is it is it, is it something you can get used to is it is it utterly horrific when you first you know when you see see someone that's in a bad way how, how does it, it on a personal level, I didn't find that it affected me deeply. I, I didn't because I didn't have a personal relationship with these people. Um, I found that the, the ones who you, you managed to speak to and then died, that might have played on my mind for a couple of days. But like I said, um, uh, just slightly before, it, it's that ability to go back onto the station and talk about it and, and even laugh about it. You know, there's always humour in, in something, even the worst case scenarios, being bombed and being electrocuted in the engine room, there's always something to find funny or something to find upsetting and talk it out and have a cry and move on. And it is that ability to do that. So when I joined the fire service, I fully expected to be doing it. So it didn't really come as a shock. If, if And I think sometimes maybe I'm being disrespectful to the younger generation, but I'll say it anyway. I don't think the younger generation are quite as robust as us. So some people are a bit airy fairy. They come into the job and then they're upset when they see dead people. It's like, what did you expect? To be honest with you, I mean, surely you steeled yourself for this and you you, you thought about what might happen. Doesn't mean you won't be upset, but you know, people do get some quite strong reactions from seeing dead people. I'm like, well, you know, it's it's sort of what we do, and it, and there is nobody else to do it. So when you join and sign up, that's you, know, you sort of know that you're going to do that surely, but. My 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 um, my robustness, I was able to use at a later date, just before I retired. Anyway, by doing some training and some some like, for want of a better word, some counselling training that showed other people, you know, it's not the end of the world. N not only is it not that upsetting, you were there to help and you've done a good job. So if you can take that and apply it every time something bad happens, I was here to help. It's not my fault. It was my mantra. It's not my fault. I didn't drive the car. I was here to help. I'm not upset. I'm not taking it home. And, and that, that, was, that was my mantra. And I think it's a really a resilient, it's resilient. It's not callous. I was accused of being callous. I've been to people that have hung themselves. And I've uh, we've had to wait a considerable amount of time for the police to turn up because it was in a wooded area. And um, so we took the mickey out of the, out of the casualty. You know, we just sat, sat on the floor and looked at him. He was spinning round and round in the wind and we was counting how many times he'd spin one way then how many times he'd spin the other way because what else can you do? You can sit there and cry or you can find something yeah, to I mean, amusing. You don't get any bloody brownie points for, for traumatising yourself, do you? So you've got to get... I, was, no. I made a, put a video out about that. I think it was today, actually. You get on and, you know... My mother was poisoned, you know, my... Um, it's fucking tough shit. <laughs> you just got to, you got to pick yourself up, and life goes on. You know, you can if you if, if it's what you you know the way you talk to yourself is so powerful. Oh gosh, and, oh, and it is the most powerful thing, the it, most powerful thing you can do. And we is have we, a conversation. We need, yeah, we need to remember that most people's the way they talk to themselves is really rubbish. God, and people love love to dine out on things and make them yeah. so much more. You know, we've all got to die, haven't we? We've all, that's one thing that we is guaranteed. Yeah. In fact, I always say we can't die. We're just as carbon molecules. We change form and we become something else that's probably a bit more beautiful than this ugly face. 
you know, we'll be a little bit in the ocean, a bit in the clouds, a bit in the birds, a bit in the... F- this is what my son... I was out with my little boy doing a bit of gardening the other day or a bit of concreting or something, and a leaf blew by, and he went, oh, granddad, right? That, to me, is so beautiful, you know, yeah. that he sees it, that his his granddad has just changed form now. He hasn't gone anywhere because we we, we, we can't... This physically cannot go any these molecules cannot go anywhere yeah so i'm really hot on that so you know talk to yourself positively shit happens yeah all right fine move on get on go go on with your life don't don't wallow in that trauma because you're creating you're creating memory files then that that, that have such a powerful effect on the rest of your life yeah um, yeah. I think as well, you, if you can have a conversation with yourself and, and allow yourself to be upset if it is upsetting and that's okay, but within a, sh- a relatively short amount of time, you need to be moving on and accepting it as something that's happened. I agree with it's virtually with everything you've just said. Um, it, it, it is about, you can't forget the bad things that happened, but you can grey them out. They, they can become black and white and unimportant. But when you don't deal with the thing that's upsetting, it, it stays bright red and hot and live in, in, inside you and, and your emotions are still attached to it. You need to talk it through to the point where virtually you're bored with it and shove it to one side. So uh, the, the people that, that hold it in and won't talk to it, they're the ones that become damaged. The actual incident is there to be talked about. Don't talk about it mm-hmm. and you're hanging on to a hot penny and all it's going to do is burn you. Yeah, I think it's, if you don't talk about it because of some preconceived ideas of how, I don't know, life is or what, what you know, stiff up a little. Uh, I think that could be quite, that's a hot potato, isn't it? That's like a, yes. a, a bubble waiting to burn. But on the other hand, my sort of way is I just, I just go on and I just don't think about it again. It's a different thing. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like I'm not yeah. holding anything in. I get life. People, I think when you're 19 years old on the streets of Belfast and one of your brothers has just been shot dead on the road, you know, that road over the, it, 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 what can you do? You, 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 you just got to go on. And things, I think you learn from a young age that, um, I mean, God, we, my primary school, one of the lads, when we was, we must have been seven. One of the lads accidentally hung himself. It was awful. Tim, his name was Timmy. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, don't really know what I'm talk, talking about, Wills. To be honest, because it's such a, yeah. it's a, it's a massive, massive, massive subject. But. Um, I, I just, I just think you've got to get a realistic idea of what life is, and then it's a lot, it's a lot less to deal with when shit does go wrong, you know. Or, or... yeah, I think, I think you've hit the nail on the head by by examining, by thinking about what's just happened to you, maybe just been involved in a smash or broke my arm, mm-hmm. by giving it some real deep thought and, and working it through, it allows you to put it to to put it to bed. But by turning away from it and pretending that it hasn't happened, you're just storing more up. And the more you store, it has to come out at some point. It's better that it comes out at the moment that you do it or that you're involved because it, it, can, it can be stored in the, in the file on the cold, not bothered, doesn't bother me anymore. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you hang on to it and turn away from it, I don't want to know, I can't think about that and suppress it, then it's going to come back and bite you on the bum. Yeah. It's and like that, that's where that's where the talking comes in. Even even if it's not structured, even if it's not in a structured way with a counsellor or a facilitator of some sort, it, it's just talking with your friends and your family, which is what we used to do. Like I say, in the fire service, just rip the shit out of the incident and, and have a giggle about it as much as we could, or a cry, and then put it to bed, and it just went away. Whereas the policeman walking around on his own, had, he didn't have that, and that's why they used to end up sick. Yeah, it's got you. It's a bit like a rally driver, you know, what they can crash a car at 140 mile an hour and it spins over and over and crashes through the fo- they get out and laugh and and, and yeah. the difference between them and if that happened to a, a non-rally driving counterpart is that 
the rally drivers expecting it. It's part of the thing. Yeah. He yeah. knows if he just huddles down, holds on, it's going to spin a few times, then they're going to get out and then, right, they'll fix the car and bang off, you know, or they're getting a new car and sort of off they go again. It's, yeah. it's, it's expected, it's compartmentalised, it's made sense of and move on. Whereas yeah, absolutely. If, some, if someone crashed their car, I don't know, at 60 mile an hour and they they they, they haven't put themselves through this mental process of knowing what's happening then it could be potentially the worst thing that's ever happened to them couldn't it it could could haunt, yeah. haunt, haunt them till they're to the end of their days i even, mean it's fixable. even though they even though they both both drivers walked away is what i'm trying to say yeah but it, it, even even the worst i mean I, I deal with people with uh ptsd complex ptsd and we can generally fix it within two to three hours by just reliving, reliving the whole issue over and over and over again until it's gone cold and they can deal with it without crying or the bottom lip quivering or, you know, it just, it goes away. You can still remember what happened, but it's, it hasn't got the emotion and the fire and the red hot heat attached to it like you, like it does when you're about to burst into tears down the pub because your mate says something that you weren't expecting and, it, and it's triggered you. That's, that's bad. That's when you know you need to do something. Mm-hmm. Let's if, come you, if, if that makes sense. Yes, let, let, we're going to come on to this, Wills, and I'm fascinated already. But let's just talk about. So, I've got written down here: London Bridge, Grenfell, and Westminster. Three pretty bloody nasty incidents. Or, or, or I mean, Grenfell just awful in terms of the numbers of people that must have. I don't think they actually ever really knew the real number, did they? Uh, do you know it, it was a lot? Um, we actually, oh dear, it's it's um, it's it's difficult. It's difficult for me to say and remain respectful of of the people at Grenfell. Mm. We actually visited Grenfell with the police officers that dealt with the incident on the night, and um, just so that they could walk around and re sort of re sort of live what had gone off. And there was only there for maybe three quarters of an hour, and that they, they we took them down in buses that were supplied by the police. Uh, we walked around the site. We didn't go into the building, but um, we left them to it. We let, we let them walk around in the little groups, and it was very quiet. You could hear a pin drop. They were talking in very, very quiet tones. And then after a short while, they began to lighten up, and you could hear little sniggles and people having a joke and nudging each other. And it was at that, that moment that you could tell the tide had turned, and they'd sort of come to terms with it. And at that moment, it's time to walk away while you've still got a good feeling. And we took them and we went and had something to eat, which would be part of one of the processes that we that we uh, use so that we'd, we'd get them extra information by going and looking at the incident, bring them away, give them something to drink and, and uh, eat and let them talk amongst themselves. Whilst we monitor what we're saying, we, we were looking for people that were triggered. And I've got to say, there weren't many. There weren't many at all. They'd come to terms with it just by revisiting. Now, if they hadn't have revisited, who knows? They might never have come to terms with it. But by being there with their mates and doing that, doing that thing that we used to do in the fire brigade, to sit around and have a talk about it, coming to terms with it, then um, I think there were I think there was around about ninety officers that we, we spoke to in that year through the three incidents, and everybody that was physically capable. Of returning to work, return to work after we'd after we'd seen them, it was a, it was a huge turnaround, and, and 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 unexpected from the Met as well. They they were taken aback by the fact that um, they was expecting a huge percentage of them to go off sick with psychological issues, mm-hmm. but because they've spoken it through and dealt with it, they they managed. I think there was a, a couple of people that were physically injured that couldn't. That one of them had been stabbed. Um, Another lady um, had got psychological issues, but we spoke to her and it, and it resolved. But it's just this act of doing, of reliving it and talking about it. it again, it's just the same story. It, it, it seems to melt away and takes all the steam and the sting out of the situation. And it's, it's not, it's not uh, medical either. It's not done by the NHS. You don't have to have a degree to do this stuff. You have to have some solid training. And um, it, it, it is the best. Yeah, I'm... I'm- um, I'm just interested in these events so we can help our friends listening 
to put yeah. into context the sort of stuff yeah, yeah. that people experience and then struggle with after. So uh, my memory's hazy on the, these these events. I, I, I don't watch the mainstream media anyway, but London Bridge was something about stabbings and, and Westminster was that. Pe- people allegedly got going, well, I'm going to I'm not going to use the the T word but uh, allegedly committing attacks um on the 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 the, the public. I'm saying allegedly because I just I find this notion that people just randomly pick up a bloody carving knife and something about it we're not we I I feel there's something about this wills we're not being told but that's a story for another day what 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 was the scene on the ground here then what was your experience of of um because you actually were there pretty much straight after is is that correct yeah well it was within a it was in a, a few weeks after the three incidents had happened uh, the team was assembled they've been trained in nottingham Fire and rescue service mm. so the team was assembled by our trainer dr john durkin and we were taken down there. It was down there for 12 days in all. Um, we did some group crisis interventions, and then we did some one-on-one stuff. So the group crisis, the, it was things like, I, I, I have to be careful about not, not to sort of identify the people that I've, I'm going to speak about because mm. it would be wrong of me. But there was, there was one particular incident where the team that were the normal police officers were on the ground on London Bridge, and they were dealing with the multiple casualties that had severe stab wounds. And uh, one of the policemen um, was actually in fear of his life. And he, and he, he explained it as, I had a, a casualty. I was on the bridge. I got a casualty. And he had so many stab wounds that I'd run out of hands and elbows and knees to, to put pressure onto his body. I'd run out of bandages. He said, the only bandage that I got left was in my pouch and I pulled it out and my hands were so full of blood that every time I tried to hold the bandage, it slipped out and I had to bite the bandage open with my teeth and I got the blood in my mouth. And he said, I knew at that moment that I was going to die, that they were going to come and get me, that they were going to stab me also because it was still active. He said, but I I couldn't walk away from my casualty. I, I had to try and save them. But there was multi. There was so many stab wounds in this individual that he couldn't plug all of them. And he was explaining how he was like kneeling and, and doing this and putting his his knee on the chest and holding onto another part with another hand. And it was just a hopeless situation, all in the knowledge that it was his last day on earth. As it turns out, it wasn't. But that was his his thought pattern, and it and he'd held that in, and and he he wasn't particularly explained. He wasn't particularly liked on the shift. But by the time he'd finished telling his story, I, c- I can't imagine anybody on that shift who didn't used to like him wouldn't hold him in the highest regard because he, he said it humbly. It wasn't bragging. He said it humbly. He just explained what happened to him. And each person in that group went round and told similar stories. And it flipped my, it flipped my perception. I didn't used to have a great perception of the police. I'd got no problem with them with regards to being in trouble, never been in trouble. Um, but I just, just think there was a bit bossy and a bit, you know, well, when you're young, um, you don't always get a great impression of the police by the way you treat it. And that was the case for me. But by the time we'd finished working with these 90 or so officers, I, I just held them in the highest regard I could. It, it just flipped. My, my, my thoughts about them flipped. It was just the things that they'd done and the way they tried to help and the danger they'd put themselves in on behalf of everybody else. It just blew me away. Honestly, it did. And so I struggle now with, with, I know some police are bad and some police are good, but I struggle with like the police being sort of piled together and they're all bad and finger pointing because there were some immensely brave people, men and women. The women did equally as good as the men, if not better. It, it was, and every story was the same. Every story. Mm. I thought I was going to die. I knew it was my last day on earth. And to sit and listen to that is very, very humbling. Thinking that I'm a, a really brave fireman and the things I do, I'm, I'm immense. You know, the, the 
public love me and all that sort of thing. That's how my perception that people think about us as firefighters. Well, if you then think, well, who do the firefighters have as heroes? And you normally say, well, just another firefighter. Well, in this case, in my case, those police officers are real heroes as well. They were absolutely immense. Yeah, so Bert, and also um, the realisation you're going to die and then actually living through it is worse than if you die. Because if you die, <laughs> it's good night Vienna. You haven't got, a, got, no yeah. worries yet. You've got no worries anymore. But to, to have that intense experience and the fear that builds up to it, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's like a, it, 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 it's an experience that very few other people on this planet are ever going Yo, where they won't experience it, so they're never going to understand. It's a, it's a very bizarre. It's it's such a unique place to be to think you're going to die. Do you generally? Oh, yeah. yeah. To be fairly sure, you're going to die. I mean, I've had that a couple of times. I had it in the Falklands, and I had it actually. I had it once at um, uh, a fire that I was in. I, I jumped onto the fire engine early. I'd gone down, done my workout for the morning. Jumped onto the fire engine of the other shift because somebody wanted to get off early. And as it turned out, I had to wear breathing apparatus at a house fire not very far away from the station. And the, as we turned up, we jumped off the fire engine, BA set on, walked across to the policeman. Now, this is one of those houses, um, I think it's called a maisonette, where you open the front door and you go straight up the stairs. There's no downstairs. And it's like a house upstairs. It is, does that make sense? Mm, a maisonette. Yes. So... Um, we said to the police, what's happening? Is, is smoke issuing from all over? And um, he says, it's okay. He says, uh, he's in there at the moment and he's got an axe. We said, right, yeah, yeah, no problem, right. So get the set on, I'll hand my tally in, we do the calculations, how much air have I got? And I went running up the stairs all excited and wanted to get stuck in. And then my mate followed me up and we have to lie on the floor. And when in a fire, if you can get right down on the very lowest part of the deck and look on the side you can generally see a, a, an area of clear air. So you can see if this casualty is laying anywhere or feet or, or, you know, whatever you can see, there's a clear, there's a clear panel right next to the floor. And so I did that and I couldn't see anything. So we, we started to move our way. We was doing the leopard crawl, starting to move our way through the, through the fire because it's, it's too hot to lift your head up. You definitely can't stand up. You, you cook yourself. So you have to leopard crawl like the Royal Marines do through, you know, through the jungles or whatever. So my mate took the right, you're not supposed to split up, but we always do. So my mate took the right hand room, which was the kitchen, went in there looking for this guy. I took the left hand room, which was a bedroom. And when you're going into a, a, a building that's on fire, you have to search everything because you can't see. So everything's done by hand. Um, you're looking on beds, under beds, opening cupboards, opening wardrobes, because children and, and adults hide in them because they think they can be safe because you know, it's full of smoke. They're trying to get away. So I'm going all around. I went around the other side of the bed and I went down towards the headboard. And then I stopped and I thought, that copper said he'd got an axe. And it, <laughs> I just ran upstairs to that, really listening to what he was saying. I realised, and I got, this, I got this picture in my head that there was a guy with a big long handle axe stood over me and it absolutely scared the crap out of me. That's one of the only times I've ever had a nightmare about the stuff I've seen. And I just blundered into this incident without, without properly stopping and thinking. It's probably, I was probably a bit younger in my career and yeah. was eager to get stuck in and fight the fire and be the hero and rescue the, the person. As it turned out, he left. He left before the police had turned up. He set fire to the upstairs using petrol and then exited. And yeah. so we came out, came out, I came out the bedroom. My oppo came out the kitchen and we met up in the hallway and then went forward into the main living room, which was the only other, the only other room. And, it, and um, the windows had gone in the room, so all the smoke had cleared and there was nobody there. But it was like a huge relief because I'd just got this idea that somebody was about to hit me on the back with a, with a huge, you know, one of those sort of huge fell, tree felling axes. And, and that actually gave me a nightmare. That, that, made me, that made me lose sleep. That's really the only time in, in the fire service, despite everything that I saw, that's the only thing that really um, touched me to, to the point where, you know, it made my bottom lip go a bit. Mm. <laughs> Ooh. 
Well, and, and I was a little bit more attentive after that. You know, you start, you learn by these things. Yes. There is no way anybody could have stood over me with an axe. But the picture in my head, as I was laying on the floor, kitten crawling down the side of the, the bed, was just this person's waiting for me. And I, I just thought, shit, that copper said, there's a guy up here with an axe. And I've just completely ignored everything he said. We shouldn't have even been in there, really. But we were. And as it turned out, it turned out all right on the day. Let's put it that way. Yes, yeah, good. Yes, our, yeah. mind, our mind can run away with us, can't it? And, and in that moment when it runs away, it can be quite, um, create a lot of panic. I think, I think there was, for me, there was a feeling of lack of control. I think it was that, oh my God, there's nothing I can do. He's going to hit me. And I, I have no idea why I suddenly got this thought that there was someone who stood over me with an axe. It just hit me. And it was this a feeling of helplessness and a lack of control that, I've not really felt before, even through the Falkland stuff. I always felt, you know, I probably won't live, but there's all an element of control. But when you're lying on the floor on your front, we're in a breathing apparatus set, it's pitch black, it's boiling hot, and you've got the idea that someone's about to launch your head off with an axe. It really is very sobering. And that's one of the that's one of the only times I've really felt like that. That's one of the only times. Mm. But, but like but it must be the same, those police officers. On West on uh, London Bridge, the, the one that was telling me about he, he knew it was his last day on earth. He knew he was going to die, but he decided, he made a decision, he was going to stick with his casualty and do his best, and at least his casualty might survive, but he knew he was going to die. We've established, sorry, what, what causes this trauma. Now let's talk about TIR, which is trauma. Traumatic incident reduction. Traumatic incident reduction. Um, yeah. Where did it first come around? Who, who, who was... it, it came about in the States um, through um, so a, a, a doctor called Sarge Gabode, um, who's a psychiatrist. And he, he started to practice psychiatry. And in his early, in his early years, he realised that it wasn't really, it didn't do what it said on the tin. You, you quite often you, you ended up um, being placed on drugs or in, in uh, mental institutions without actually solving the problem. So he, uh, he started to, to do his own, um, look into his own philosophy and, and, look, and reaching out and finding all the different things. In it. And he, uh, he came up with a system of working with people that is non-medical. It doesn't diagnose. We, I don't diagnose people. In fact, for the most, I actually ignore people's diagnosis. They come to me and say, um, oh, I've got PTSD. I'll say, right, I don't like using PTSD. Can we just say you're pissed off and angry? Yeah, that'll do. You know, it, it just gives it a different name without, without the feeling that you're some sort of victim. Because anybody can be pissed off and angry, but not everybody has PTSD. And after all, it's only a word and a collection of signs and symptoms. And if you can get rid of the signs and symptoms, you haven't got anything. You're just pissed off and angry. So it's, it's a really effective method. And it permanently resolves past traumas. So once you've done a session, we'll pick a person might have 10 incidents that they want to talk about and we'll pick one at a time and we'll do that incident to death in one session. And we won't finish until it's resolved. Mm. And by resolved, I mean it's no longer an issue in your life and it is unlikely to become an issue in the future. Completely permanently resolved without the need. For, for anybody in the, in the medical world, even knowing you don't need any of that. Yeah, they I'm claim sure. to be the leading experts, but this does it without any of their intervention. Yeah, I'm guessing this is ad- adult trauma, trauma though, isn't it? This is for people you, that... I don't deal with children. I, I don't deal with anybody under the age of 16. Um, there is some additional training. I can do if I want to and, and sort of ramp it down a little bit, but I choose not to. Um, I've, I've, got, I've had two kids of my own. I've got a grandson and I don't want to go in that space in my head. I, I don't, I'm not quite, quite sure how I'd, I'd sit with that. I, I, I struggle slightly with sexual stuff. I do a lot of that, mostly for females. And although I'll do it and I'll do it willingly, I, I, um, I do reflect on that more heavily than, than, uh, other stuff so i have I, I i pick and choose i don't do kids i don't do the kids stuff either. yeah no the reason I, the reason i mention it is um 
when you experience trauma at a, a very young age, like many of us have, yeah, you 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 don't you you physically your mind doesn't have the ability your brain to to, to make sense of it because you no absolutely you, know, you put yeah. through this you you know you have some horrendous experiences. And then you're left on your own. You don't have anyone to talk to about. It's not like you can go, hey, look, yeah, this just happened to me. Or that. So what happens is at that young age, your mind, again, compartmentalize it as like you're a damaged person. You know, there's something you yeah. do that, that's not right. Yeah. And this, is, this is why it's so catastrophic in later light when this, yeah. when, when this starts to come to the surface. You know, for example, when people leave the forces and it, you you know, people really start to have a wobble because it's this internalized trauma that you physically don't have the ability to make sense of because you're not an adult, you're a child, you know, you're a kitty, right? Whereas adult trauma is different. You know, you smash your car into a wall at 100 mile an hour. Yes, it's not nice. No one's ever going to pretend it is. However, you're an adult. You can get out that car. Someone can sit you down and go, right, come on, come on. Let's calm down, calm down. Deep breaths. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a bit of metal. It's smashed up. You're okay, or you know, you you you've lost an arm, but we'll we'll the you know prosthetics are good. These do you know what I mean? You can you can talk yeah. to people and they can rationalize and go, oh yeah yeah you're right yeah yeah okay do do do. The child and stuff you can't do you because you can't do that at a young age. No. It gets stored in like a I don't know. It gets stored somewhere, Will's. You know. In, in a kind of like, I can't, I don't physically cannot deal with this. And as yeah. such, it's not something then that you can just like therapy, ther you know, thera have therapeutics. You, you, you come up with strategies to cope with it is what I'm saying, as opposed to yeah. being able to, I just, I just wanted to ascertain this. This sounds like it's something that's probably really good for, one one of the things that you can you can do is I don't I don't work directly with children, but the, the adults I do work regress right all the way back. Some of their incidents I talk about from the age of two or three. So if that's I'm happy to do that. It's just that I'm not trained to to work directly with children, but I could do if I if I wanted to. But mm. by the by, so um, it's it's called suppression when you push it when you push it away and you don't want to think about it and you compartmentalize it into your mind. It's called suppression. And, that's, um, a, that's a. I just want to say, for the sake of people, it, that that's a different thing. Again, it, suppression is when, like, you, well, I can't be dealing with that shit. Therefore, I yeah. won't. I won't deal with it. I won't think about it. Yeah. yeah. What What I'm it's, saying is, when your child, you can't deal with it. You're a child. You haven't. No. You You haven't got the cognition yet in which to no. make sense of life. And so, but you it's, it's still, yeah, it's still suppression. It still comes down to the same thing. The child doesn't know how to deal, so they'll probably stop thinking about it and then hopefully pretend it never happened but it'll always come out at a later date and then we'll deal with it then but suppression is is, is quite a um, it's like putting like having all your dark thoughts and putting them into a black cupboard on the on the side of the wall there and locking the key now i've got the key and i've got to remember not to go in that black cupboard because that's where all the nasty things are so i'll put this key in my pocket but i know i've got the key and I also now I've got to think, don't put my right hand in my right pocket because that's where the key is that holds all the dark thoughts in the corner over there. So it's actually harder work to suppress something that is to get it out in one go, cry about it, fall out with yourself for five minutes and then move on. You can spend your whole life trying to pretend not to go in this pocket where the key is to the cupboard. And that takes a huge amount of energy. And it will always come out. It'll come out unexpectedly. You'll be triggered by something down the pub even though you've left the key in your pocket, you think you're safe, somebody will say something, one of your mates in the pub will say something. And this has happened to me about the Falklands. People have asked me stuff and quite unexpectedly, but my bottom lip started to go a little bit. And I have to like stutter and go, oh, uh, 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 I don't really talk about this because I can feel myself going. And so it wasn't until I got rid of that, until I, for want of a better word, unsuppressed myself and, and faced my, my fears and faced the fact that I might get upset that it went grey and went away. And I can talk about it any amount of time now. As you've heard, I could talk about it all day. But until I, until I um, came to terms with it and spoke about it openly and repeatedly over and over again to make it go away, and that's all it was, 
just mm. just boring yourself with it to the point where I'm not really interested. If you're bored with something, how can you be uh, traumatized by it? If you think about that, and, and if you think about any situation where you've been traumatized and you've spoken about it enough times where you're bored by the sound of your own voice, it's not traumatic anymore, is it? It's that simple. How could it possibly tra- be traumatic if it makes you yawn? Yeah, I think we need to point out here, Wills, that, that um, not all therapies work every time for every no, true. Bod- body. Um, for example, talking therapy, it can be great, but also in, in certain, I don't know, let's call it arenas, helping people relive through something which is actually reinstating the fear then it's telling the brains like it's like rewarding the brain for fear saying you're right to be to feel it's a very probably a hard concept for people listening i have no idea of this area but what i'm saying is is the reason people get in such hyper vigilant high anxiety um states where it can result in panic attacks or the point we can't go yeah. out of the house is what they're doing is every time they sort of shy away from the fear rather than bang facing it head on it tells the brain that oh you did well there that that, that was a bear in the wild coming to attack you that was a you know when you're a caveman that's a bloody rhinoceros gonna gore you to, you did well you did when actually you didn't do well you you, no. you you were it was like an aversion to dealing with reality but our brain's so clever it tells the brain that um oh you did well there you just escaped a rhino you just escaped a spear you just escaped a deadly bloody shark or what where in actual fact you you kind of didn't and what and what it does is it reinforces your flight or flight mechanism that little bit more and eventually by this constant moving away from the thing rather than acknowledging it you build yourself into such a hyper anxious state. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I just wanted just wanted to mention that because um, it's yeah. I, th- I I just don't want people out there who've tried this form of intervention or they try this and it doesn't work to think oh that they're a broken machine that nothing's going to work. It's no. It's that it's that this no. is a complicated area and it's uh, it's um. You know. it's, it's complicated in some respects, but to me, it's really simple. For me, actually, the people that, that um, are the worst affected by trauma are the easiest because I can see where it is and I can see what I'm doing. It's like shining a big light on it. So if somebody comes to me massively upset, I've got all these signs and symptoms, you know, things like um, PTSD, anxiety, depression, flashbacks, hypervigilance, all those things. If I can see that, I know exactly where we're going to go with it. So I would sit them down opposite them like we're sat with you and I would go through a series of questioning over and over again and get them to relive it to the point where it's just, it goes away. It's quite an astonishing thing to watch and you can, you can see it happening. You can see the penny dropping. That's not effective anymore. Why do I need to do that? Do you know, do you know what, Wills? I'm all right. That's quite often. And another common thing they say to me when they get to their what we call an endpoint, when they get to their endpoint is, what the hell have you just done to me? I feel completely different. That's really weird. Why am I not scared anymore? I get those sorts of reactions. I've been doing it for six years and I haven't not got a good endpoint for somebody. I haven't had like um, something where somebody's gone, well, that hasn't bloody worked. It just works. It works. It works every time. I, I, I can't promise anything because I'm, I'm not superhuman. But I haven't had somebody, and I've had a lo- hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours doing this, of the worst possible things you can think of, rapes, um, assaults, IEDs, firefights, you name it, I've done it. Or not I've done it, I've assisted people to work through it. And it just works. It's amazing. And what I'd love to do is to do it for somebody, and then they come on your show and go, do you know something? That was just amazing. I am completely back to normal. I don't even want to say the word cured or treated because that sounds like um, I'm some sort of medical person, and I'm not. We just follow. We follow a um, 
a set of rules and regulations, rules of facilitation, it's called, and it works. It's absolutely bang on. Mm. And are you, are you it, it would stop a lot of suicides within the forces if, if we could get it recognised in the UK. It's only recognised in, in the States at the moment that um, the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programmes and Practices, so it's like an evidence-based practice in the States, mm. but NICE won't, won't accept it in this country, which is a shame because people are topping themselves and, and it can be stopped. It can very, very relatively easily. It's not, it's not easy for the person to, to work through, so they're going to have three hours maybe of being upset and crying, but at, at the end of it, the, at the end of it, they are going to get to the point where it's gone grey. Do you know what? I remember it happening. I can see how it would be upsetting, but it doesn't affect me anymore. There's no need to be this upset. It was 20 years ago, or it was, in my case, 40 years ago. Why would I be crying about the Falklands? It's 40 years ago. We lead you to that point. You do it for yourself. So that's, that's, that's literally how it works. You just do it over and over again. But there's a skill to it, obviously. Also, we'd all be doing it. And it, it, and it be, took um, me... It, it, it can't be that straightforward, though, because, I mean, it's a typical person I speak to with milit- what, what you'd think was military trauma... Whenever you dig a bit, it just turns out it's not. It's childhood trauma. Yes, yes, and it does. It does in this case, and so we go from we go from one technique called uh, basic traumatic incident reduction, and we go to we slip into another one called thematic traumatic incident reduction, and and what that does that searches backwards. It goes through time of incidents where you felt like that, and we go back to what's called the root cause, and the root cause. 99% of the time is in childhood. So I, that's my bread and butter. The one where I was talking about where you got blown up on a train or something like that, that is basic TIR where it's a known incident, is one thing that's bothering you and we can go straight there and deal with it. With thematic, there's a theme to it and you can go backwards and backwards and backwards in time through reliving past experiences where you've had that feeling and get to the root cause and once you know what caused it initially, you can then decide whether your reaction is still appropriate nowadays. And then you can choose to, well, people just literally choose. This is not, this is silly. Why am I still acting like this? I'm not going to do it anymore because they understand it in its entirety. Mm. So um, all, I've, all I've, I've sort of skimmed over it because it's a dry subject. Talking about this sort of stuff is a dry subject. I could go yeah, on no, about I think, it. Yeah, no, I think you've done really well and you've, done, you've certainly said enough to get people, um, you know, it, 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 interested. Friends at home, if you're listening, if you want to get in touch with Wills, is going to put his details below if you think this could be an, an area you'd like to check out, obviously, in all this kind of thing. I'm sure Wills is just available for a chat, you know, just a kind yeah, of exploratory of or a discovery chat, um, you know, to see if this stuff could help you out. But I mean, it's that thing, isn't it? That it it's just great when someone finds that thing that's been holding them back. Oh, yeah. oh it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. It's, I, do, I, I do sort of um, three quarters of the stuff I do, I get paid for because I've got to make a living. And then, for some of the military stuff, particularly depending upon what they've been through, I would just do it for free because it's a, it's the right thing to do. And we're all brothers and sisters. And um, if somebody's about to top themselves and we can just have a conversation for two hours and stop that from happening, what a gift. Who cares about money in that situation? Yeah, do you find... Um, I, th- oh, I think we was probably all like it back in the day when we were struggling. But when I speak to people, it's, yeah, I, it's that thing, isn't it? You, it, It's hard to gauge how much like we come on as individuals and how much we learn. And we forget that we were probably a bit, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, friends. I'm not making sense. I, I get it a lot. Some things in life are just not easy to explain. Um, I just think 
when you're in a, the, the throes of that kind of trauma thing and you, or you're drinking too much or drugs or, or, or yeah, yeah. You, know, you can't work because you're a mess or your family don't want to speak, all that kind of I, it, it's It's all about understanding, isn't it? It's all about, you know, understanding in your actions and even like the worst awful city that you think it, it, a few little tweaks here and there and it just reframes it completely differently um, yeah absolutely yeah i think the biggest the biggest warning for people is what am i going to get into if i go and do this and uh, i'm not going to pretend it's easy for people to do that they're not going to get emotional and upset but compared to spending your whole life mm. hiding it away or or being triggered in certain circumstances Two or three hours of doing this has got to be better than the whole life of, of being frightened of what might come out accidentally. It's, Wills, it's, how do, ha, ha, sorry, how do people fund this? Do they, do they pay for it out of their own pocket? Do you get any kind of um, support? No, I don't get any support from anybody. I do charge people. Um, I, I do charge people because I have to, because it's my job. Well, let's, this, let, let, let's just, I just want to chip in there. Yeah. You know If folks don't want to pay for their own future, they, 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 they it's going to be, they're going to be bloody hard to work with. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. not everybody's got the money to do it though. And that's, that's one of the, that's one of the things. So um, if I can do like, um, if I can do first aid on something and, and get a major issue sorted out, um, then, and, and they're a brother or sister from the forces, then I'd like to be able to help, but I can't be swamped with the whole of the British forces contacting me personally, because there's only one of me and, you know, I've got a life outside of, of, of doing this. Um, if I could aim my offer, my aim would be towards the more specialist role, the special forces, the, the intelligence people who struggle to talk because of the type of work that they do. So they, they, they're reticent to go and see the doc because they might end up losing their job or going, you know, put onto medication and that will affect the job, firearms, police and things like that. That that's what I would do. I'd go to the people at the tip of the spear who are likely to lose their, their work and, and say to them, if you could find um, a way of talking with me, I won't identify you. You can give me a pseudonym. You don't have to tell me what unit you're in. If just by having an open conversation, I don't take notes. I don't report to anybody. I don't talk to people about what, what's happened? It's not my business. I'm, I'm here to help. I'm not here to collect stories and more stories. It's not my. I'm not writing a book. I don't record anything. And the only time I would have to, I'd be legally bound to speak to somebody. If somebody said, "I've got this bomb here, look, Andy. I'm going down this. I'm going down the road. I'm going to go and blow up Buckingham Palace. I might have to go. Shit, is this real? I, I better ring the police. Mm. Or if somebody was telling me there was a paedophile and they'd done something, and it was serious. I might have to do that, but that's never happened. It, Who, who's yeah. going to go and admit those things to me online? It's just yeah. not going to happen. Well, it's a bit like in the social field in general, isn't it? If you've if you if you if you've got concerns for the safety of anybody, you you're yeah. du duty bound to report that to the relevant authorities. Um, but if, if I think about the amount of times I've said, you know what, my mission is I'm going to bloody kill her when I get home. It doesn't mean I'm going to go home and kill it. So you have to sometimes. When people say things, you have to take it in context and, and sometimes with a pinch of salt. And so yeah, I, wouldn't, all, I, wouldn't, all, I wouldn't take notice of things like that. I just it might be people just, threatening to kill themselves as well, mightn't it? It's, um... Yeah, and, and that I do have people that are suicidal and are saying, they don't say, right, I'm going to go and kill myself right now. They'll be telling me about their suicidal thoughts. And I say, have you got any, any plans to do it? How are you going to do it? Have you got the means? And if they say yes, we'll say, right, before you did decide to do that, Let's go through this process. What's the worst that can happen? You might end up being happy. Mm. Okay. And then we'll go through the process. And then they come out to the side. This is what happens all the time. They come out to the side and say, do you know what? I'm going to give it a go. I feel different. What have you done to me? That's mm. nearly always. That's one of the, 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 most, the, the, the most used phrase, phrases is, what have you done to me? And then my reply is, I haven't done anything. You've done all the work. I've sit and listened but you've done the work because the work goes off in their own head. Yes. 
Well, so I'm going to thank you there. Um, thank you massively for um, all, all of your service. Thank going you. back to <laughs> back to your teenage years. Um, yes, it's when you need a fireman, you need a bloody fireman, don't you? Let's be honest. And yeah, <laughs> they they, yeah. they are literally prepared to put their life on the line for you and your children. And that is just um, gosh makes me feel emotional just uh just thinking about it so massive thank you on behalf of the podcast um but also for what you're for what you're doing now clearly putting out some good into the world at a time where a lot of damaged individual my, my thing i when people talk about ptsd and they make out it's this thing that only military guys get if this if they get blown up and no I don't just enlighten to the fact that no, actually most of the military get it in childhood. Right? Yeah. I, it's, it's I, I then enlighten them to the fact that everyone's got PTSD. We live in a society that traumatizes us from birth, tells us we're not good enough. You know, my generation, we were beaten at school. We were whipped. Oh we, God. We, yeah. We, we yes. were stripped. We were <laughs> stripped, stripped off in front yeah. of the class. We were, put in cupboards we had stuff thrown at us we were spanked you know in in, in, in caned in front of the, yeah. and that's just that's just school <laughs> right imagine that, that was imagine the shit know, behind closed doors right and but even to modern kids that to what i've just said they'd find a bar and what people were allowed to hit you yeah a, any adult could hit you when i was a kid any adult right yeah didn't even yeah. like have to have a reason but to youngsters now that find that abhorrent Think of the damage you're going through when you spend all your day on this, which is a device that essentially destroys your identity, who you really are in your community. And, and you're bombarded by this false, th this celebrity culture, which is just utter nonsense because all oh, the time. Garbage. Yeah, all the time. I, I rant about this stuff all the time to my wife and to my to my daughter because they follow things online and I just go, Jim, what are you listening to? Yeah. Why are you why are you concerned for these multi-millionaires? These multi-millionaire footballers boo-hooing on the floor. Mm -hmm. it, it, it drives me insane, honestly. What's up with you? Get up. Yeah. So you know, so uh, it's we we've all been traumatized, you know. We've all got to rise above all this nonsense and uh demand a, a better future so there you go folks look brought it all home to everyone haven't i we've all been traumatized yeah. so and yeah. stop labeling each other stop telling yeah. each other we've got this that and the other you know just yeah. think about it in a different way yeah exactly uh they don't call a lot of people don't call it ptsd anymore do they post they don't call it disorder they just call it post-traumatic stress and it's a completely normal thing which it which it is it's your body's natural reaction to being in a dodgy situation Yes. Yeah. Wills, massive, massive thanks to you, mate. I'm going to put your details below. Just stay, hold the line for a minute so I can um, thank you properly and see if I can borrow some money off you after this. <laughs> um, of course. And to our friends at home, I hope you've got as much out of that as, as I had. What, what a ride. We started off in the Falklands and we've ended up with, um, you know, in, in the social field. Uh, if you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time. Love it. Thank you very much for asking, Chris.